Mark chapter 4, we, um, we made it through verse 20. We're going to kind of breeze through a little bit quickly through verse 34, and we're going to really dig in verse 35. Now, if you remember, we left off. Jesus gives us the parable of the seed and the sower. And, you know, the parable is basically, can, you know, as he takes his disciples aside and he explains it to them, it's basically to tell us that the seed is the word of God. Jesus is the one sowing the seed, okay? And then he tells us where the seed falls. Remember the illustration of the farmer throwing the seed, and I believe the farmer was out on the, you know, across the way from the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus, as he's telling this parable, he's, the, the farmer's out there sowing the seed, so the people get a visual picture as to what Jesus is talking about. Some seed fell on the pathway, the hard ground. Some seed fell on what seemed to be good ground, but there were rocks underneath, right? Some seed fell and the soil wasn't prepped and there were too many thorns and thistles that came up and choked it. And some seed fell on good ground. Now the picture and the illustration is what? It has to do with the human heart. The ground is the condition of the human heart. That the word of God goes forth, okay? And whether it takes root or not has to do with the heart of the individual. If it's ready to receive, then it'll bring forth good fruit. If there's stones in the heart and rocky places, remember Jesus said those, these are those whom when persecution arises, because of the word's sake, they go away. And then some of the seed takes root and does start to grow, but then thorns and thistles come and there's too many thorns and there's too many thistles, there's too many weeds, so to speak, and they kind of overtake the heart of that Christian. And Jesus said, these are those who are like, who love this world too much, who receive the word with gladness. They probably are saved, but then the, everything in the world causes them to just go away from Jesus. They're, they're caught up too much with this world. And then he said, some is sown in good soil and bring forth fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Now listen, as he's telling this parable, as he explains, remember the, the, the seaside is packed with people. Could be 20 to 40 to 50,000 people there. We're not 100% sure. But Jesus moves out a little bit toward the water and as he's speaking, remember his voice is traveling. They're all hearing it and they're all getting it and they're all probably turning around to look at this farmer at the same time sowing the seed. Now after that, he explains it to his disciples, and then we pick it up in verse 21, Mark chapter 4. He said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifest, neither was there anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, for him shall be taken, even that which he hath. And he said, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Didn't he just speak about this parable? And he's going to get a little bit more detail. He's going to talk about mustard seed now. And should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knows not how. Someone goes out, throws the seed. We can't fully figure out how these things exactly grow. Jesus said the person goes to sleep. Next thing you know, the seed starts to grow. Should sleep and rise night and day, verse 27, and the seed should spring up and grow, grow up, and he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit in herself, first the blade, then the ear, after the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. And he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown into the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air make lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all these things to the disciples. All right. Let me tell you what's going on here. A lot of scripture. 
But remember, he just tells the parable of the sower. And remember what I said. The soil condition has to do with the human heart. And basically, he says, those who receive the word and start to bring forth fruit, God expects them to shine as lights in the world. And he says, no one takes a candle and puts it under a basket or under a bushel. Again, that's how they had light back then at night. Candles, wax. You would be stupid if you went into your house and you lit a candle and and you put it under a basket. You probably start a fire, but if anything, the fire is going to go out and there's going to be no light in the house. And he goes, those who receive the word with gladness, God expects something from their life. Those who receive the word, God expects fruit to come from their life. And he says, that's how the kingdom of God grows. So he takes the parable of the sower and of the seed, and then he says, okay, those who receive the word start to bring forth fruit, and it looks like it's a little bit of a mustard seed going on, as we read on. And, and, and the mustard seed was the smallest seed to them in that day and age in, in Israel. And he says, but it's a small seed, but if it's sown and it's watered, you know, and the person goes to sleep, things start to happen, things start to grow. And he goes, the person doesn't know how it grows, but he gets up and it starts to grow. And li- listen, that's how the kingdom started. All right? The kingdom age. With a few believers where the word of God came in, found some soft ground with the disciples and the 120 in the upper room, right? Not everybody believed, but then things started to sprout and things started to grow. And here we are over 2,000 years later preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, people getting saved all over the world. Now listen, The same is true in our lives. When we give out the word of God, because like I said last week, that's our our only job. We can't change the human heart. We can't get people to see things our way. God already told us that. We can't, as, uh, as educated as we are, as intelligent as we are, all those things, only God can prep the human heart. God can prep the soil to receive the word of God. We're just supposed to sow it. We're just supposed to put it out there. Whether it's one at a time or a hundred at a time or once a week or whatever God gives you the opportunity, just let it out there. And you say, well, Pastor Matt, I've been talking to my mother, my grandmother, my relatives, my neighbors for years about Jesus. It used to be every day, but now it's once a year. Because I just don't see anything growing. Well, listen, you sow the seed. You sow the seed. Usually, especially when it comes to family, you're not going to be the one to lead them to Jesus. Once in a while, once in a while, because they don't want to hear it from you. You know, you talk to my mother, I'm, I'm still the same person, still the same kid, still the, and she does whatever she can to, to get that side out of me too sometimes, really. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. But you don't know the way God works. See, the seed starts to grow. It starts to germinate. You know, five, ten years later, they'll be at work somewhere, and they'll meet somebody, you know, they're working in an office with, with, and they find out, hey, you're a Christian? Oh, man. And it could be that person that waters, right? And it will start to grow. And things start to happen. I've heard of people who prayed for their loved ones for five, ten, twenty, fifty years, one person. And then that person came to Christ. It's God's work. It's our job just to sow the seed. And things start off small, but things start to germinate and things start to grow. Now listen. Now the parable here toward the end that we just read, verse 32, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. It says from this point on that Jesus speaks to the multitudes in parables. And remember why he did that? He did that, he said, sometimes to conceal and to reveal. What does that mean? For those whose hearts did not want to receive. For those whose hearts were like the hearts of the wayside. The devil comes and just steals the word right away. For those whose hearts who were not tender, who did not want to receive anything, who were just along for the ride, whether either wanted to see miracles or mock the ministry, whatever it was, he said, I speak to them in parables to conceal things because I really don't want them to know because their hearts aren't ready to handle it and they don't want to handle it. But he goes, the ones who really do want to know, those ones will receive the word. 
And Jesus speaks to them in parables. And at the end of this parable, he says, the mustard seed, which is a picture of the church, starts to grow and becomes greater than all herbs. So is the kingdom of God. It started small with 12, then 120, then 3,000, then 5,000. Next thing you know, the apostle Paul goes to all of Asia Minor. And here we are again, over 2,000 years later, churches all over the world. But, he, but then he says, the fowls of the year come and make their homes in the branches of this great tree now. It's a picture of the devil trying to destroy the church. It's a picture of unbelievers that lodge in the church and try to destroy the church. But you know what Jesus said about that? If you read Matthew 24, 25, he said, let those things happen. He goes, listen, it's not our job because you can't read everybody's heart. I cannot either. But God sees the human heart. God, who, God knows who are the, the genuine believers that love Jesus, and God knows who the phonies are. He does. And sometimes God will reveal it to us right now, but a lot of the times it won't be revealed until Judgment Day. That's what he said in Matthew chapter 7. There'll be those sitting there on that day, there'll be the Lord Lorders, the professors, profess this and they profess that. Maybe a lot of professors, I don't know. And Jesus said, I didn't know you. I never had a relationship with you. You just used my word in... in, in my means for your own ends. That's what he says. And, and Jesus says, let it happen. He goes, the birds and the unbelievers, the fowls, which are a picture of the devil and his minions, they'll lodge there in the churches till the end. But in the end, God will send the reapers and God will sort it all out. But it's our job just to preach the gospel. It's our job to let our light shine. It's our job to live for Jesus Christ as much as we can on this earth right now and bring him the most glory in our lives. And let God sort all that other stuff out. Now, verse 35. So the same day, or again, he gets his disciples alone. He explains these parables to them. And the same day, when the evening was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Remember, they were on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and they, they're going to pass over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is not that big. It's only about 33 miles around if you walked around. It took a long time to walk around. It took a quarter of the time to go across, okay? It's really like a big, giant lake in Israel. And Jesus says, let us pass over. Let us go to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. Now listen, they say, Jesus, all right, let's go. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. They say, all right, how are we going to get there? They get in these little fishing boats, this little fishing boat. Now again, we think of a fishing boat, and we think of some massive boat with gigantic nets and cranes and all that stuff. That's not what they had. The boat was probably from here to the back door, all right? And no wider than maybe four or five aisles. And with a sail in the middle, okay? It wasn't a giant boat, but that's what they used to fish. They would literally go out on the Sea of Galilee, they'd stand on the boat, and they would cast their nets into the water. So this is the kind of boat they get on with Jesus, because Jesus said, let us go together and pass to the other side of the sea. He leaves the multitudes after he teaches them about the kingdom, after he teaches them about his word, and then he explains to them, you know what? He expects some results. He expects them to make a decision. Where was the word of God falling on all the multitude's hearts? Were they going to bring forth fruit or not? And he says, if it brings forth fruit, then let your light shine. Start to grow. Then he takes his disciples. He goes to the other side, gets them in the boat. They say, okay, Lord, let's get in the boat. And they basically say, Lord, you know what? This is what they do. I, I can picture. I can picture Peter. Lord, that was a great sermon. But I'm the fisherman. Peter had a couple of encounters like this with Jesus. Okay? I'm the fisherman. All right, Lord, you did a great job. You taught the multitudes all day. You've been healing multitudes, Lord. You know, let us serve you now, Lord. Let us serve you. You know you never served Jesus. You realize that, right? You serve Jesus by serving his people. You get that? 
But Peter thinks that, hey, Lord, let me, we're going to take care of you now, Lord. Come on into the boat. You told us to go to the other side. Let us go in, you know, you go to the back, take a rest. We'll handle this. You can't, listen, Jesus needs to handle everything all the time. I'm serious. Listen, I used to think, hey, I have strengths and I have weaknesses. And God, you want to glorify yourself in my weaknesses, but you know, my strengths I can handle. Then I walk with Jesus for a little while and I say, you know what? I don't have any strengths. Jesus has them all in me. That's it. He gets all the glory. Really? All of it. Peter, like, this is my strength, Lord. You go in the back. You take a rest. I'm the fisherman. You be the rabbi. Let us serve you for a little while. Okay. So, now Jesus has already said, let us go to the other side. So he knows that they're going to get over there. They're going to make it. Verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Now listen, the wind, right? If, there were, if it was a westerly wind, it was a calm wind. If it was an easterly wind, it came over Mount Hermon, okay, which was cold on the top of the mountain, snow caps, and the wind would just come all of a sudden over the sea. And the disciples, being fishermen, would understand which way the wind's blowing. If it's coming from the east, watch out. If it's coming from the west, no big deal. So the wind starts to blow. They realize it's an easterly wind. It's whipping down over Mount Hermon, okay? And it starts to come. Now, again, this isn't a giant ocean. It's a, it's a big lake, the Sea of Galilee. And, and the disciples start to realize, hmm, this isn't a westerly wind. This is an easterly wind. Things start to happen. Now listen, Jesus put them into the sea. Jesus told them, let us go to the other side. So they, they said, okay, Lord, you sit in the back, you get a pillow, you relax, we'll handle it. But listen, Jesus is going to put them in a storm and he's going to put them in the storm for a reason. Now listen, you might have heard me say this before, but there's storms in our lives. There's storms of correction and there's storms of, listen, perfection. This is a storm of perfection. Jesus wants to perfect them. Jesus puts them into the sea because he wants to teach them something about their faith. Now listen, if you're honest with God, and if I'm honest with God, most of the storms and the trials in our lives are storms of correction. Okay? I love the people who say, why is God making this, doing this to me? God could deliver me. If I, this is the one I get all the time. If I was a father, and if I know I could take care of my kid and protect him from this, I would use everything in my power to protect my son or my daughter from this. And I look at him and I say, wait a minute. Didn't you make that, de de that decision to, you know, not to show up for work on time 20 times? Yeah, but is it, no, didn't you do that? So when you lost your job and you have no money, right? You're going to say, why God? And it's his fault, right? Didn't you make that? A lot of the storms in our life, most of them, for some of us, are storms of correction. We put ourselves, you know, we make the problem. We create the problem. That was Jonah. Not Jonah Hadley. Jonah the <laughs> prophet. He could talk to you. He could talk to you about some storms of correction, though, anyway. Talk to him afterwards. But listen. All right. You know, Jonah, go to Nineveh. This is where I want you to go to preach to these people. I ain't going that way, God. I'm not doing what you want me to do. Absolutely not. I don't like those people. I don't care for them. God said, I told you to go this way. He goes that way. To Tarsus. God sends a storm of correction. It was such a storm of correction that the unbelievers started to realize, oh man, hey, doesn't this guy say he's a prophet? Doesn't he say he, he believes in the true God? What is going on? They grab him. They say, hey, what's going on? Jonah said, yeah, it's my fault. We're all going to die here. But if you throw me off the boat, you'll survive. That's what happens. So they take him and they throw him off the boat. That was a storm of correction. This is a storm of, listen, 
perfection. Some of perfection. God wants to perfect our faith. God wants us to do more with our faith. Peter and the other fishermen thought they had it all figured out. Lord, you ministered all day. Now it's our turn. We'll take care of you. Well, you need to learn some things, guys. That's what he tells them. Now look. There arose a great storm of wind. The waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. So you can the, the ship's filling up with water, the boat. It's just filling up with water. Waves beating into the ship, coming over the top, into the boat. Can you picture it? Now they know, they, they realize that this is an easterly wind, that they're going to go down if something does not happen. But they're not remembering the words of Jesus, where Jesus already said, what? Let us go into the, in, in, and go to the other side, into the boat to the other side. Jesus already said, we're going to make it. Let us go. We're going somewhere. But they're not remembering that. Because all they see right now is all the chaos. All they see right now is the waves beating against the ship, the, the ship, the storm. That's all they can focus on. That's all they have their eyes on. Sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? When things go on in our lives... Especially when it's a storm of perfection. I, I don't like storms of perfection. I don't like storms of correction either. But Lord, I'm good. I, I got to a place. I walk by faith for this long in this area. Please, just I, I just want to have a peaceful life. No chaos. Let the bills get paid. You know, let the kids just you know grow up and, 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 and be all right for you, God. Just Lord, I just want everything to work out nice and easy. That's not the Christian life. God wants to grow our faith. He wants to stretch our faith. Okay? The waves are beating on the ship. Water's filling up the boat. All they can focus on is the storm, just like we do sometimes. All we can focus on is what we're, what's going on in that moment. What's going on with our son, our daughter, our husband, our wife, our job? That's all we can focus on sometimes. Sometimes we can't see through that to the words of Jesus where he said, let us go to the other side. See, because that's what we need to do in the midst of the storms. We need to, in, in the midst of the storms, we need to say, okay, Lord, the waves are crashing. The water's filling up. The rain's coming down. But Lord, you've said to us, we're going to the other side, so we're going. Because you know you are, right? You know life is a big giant storm. But Jesus told you what? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. I give to them eternal life. They'll never perish. You're going to make it to the other side. It might not be as smooth sailing as you want it to be. But you're going to make it to the other side because Jesus is faithful. Now, verse 38. He was in the hinder part of the ship. Asleep, on a pillow. It was the oarsman's pillow. The guy who did the, the rowing in the back, he had to take a rest sometimes from the, you know, when he could, and he, there would be a, a pillow set for him. Jesus is laying on that. He's asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care about what's going on? Don't you care that we're going to die? Don't you care that we're not going to make it here? Carest thou not that we perish? It's interesting. The wind doesn't wake him up. The waves don't wake him up. The water doesn't wake him up. The sail whipping around and probably torn off by now doesn't wake him up. But his kids wake him up. Right? They wake him up. Not that he wasn't in full control anyway. Because he was. He's asleep in the boat in a storm. Asleep. Out like a light. All right? Getting some rest. After a long three days ministry in a row of healing, preaching, he's getting some rest. The only time he could. And they come and they say, Lord, wake up, wake up. Don't you care that we perish? Don't you care? And we go to God like that. In storms of correction and in storms of perfection. God, don't you care? He cares. He does care. 
He loves you. He said, every one of you, the, the hairs of your head is numbered. He knows what's going on in your life. He had a plan for you. Ephesians chapter 1 says, and it stems back from before the foundation of the world. And it goes all the way into eternity with God. He has a plan for you. He cares. He does care. But we need to run to him. We need to go to him. We need to say, Lord, you know what? Right now I don't feel like you care, but Lord, I trust your word. It says you do, but God, I need some direction. I need some strength. I can't make it through this without you. Please help me, God. Have you realized yet that God loves to be our Savior? Not just our Savior for, for eternity, but our Savior out of everything. He delivers us out of all our troubles, the psalmist says. Look what he does. He arose. He stands up. He rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. Literally, quiet, be muzzled. But what he says is, Shut up. That's what he says. Shut up. Be muzzled. That's, he gets up and he rebukes the wind. And listen, God will do that in our lives. God has done that in our life. Some of you can testify to that. Some of you can testify to things in your life that, you know what, you're going down, you're going under, whether it's a storm of correction or a storm of perfection. Sometimes we don't know the difference. Sometimes we do. And sometimes we're like, Lord, if you don't do something, Lord, I'm going to perish. I feel like I'm going to die. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to have a nervous breakdown, whatever it is. God, please. Peace be still. Peace be still. Whether that's a different perspective on the way we start to see things, listen, or whether it's God does something in our life where that mortgage payment does get paid somehow, or whether it's somebody coming out and speaking the truth when somebody has said so many horrible things about you, God has done that in our lives. Peace be still. Peace be still. And he and listen, he the, the wind stops. The waters that are waves become calm. Become calm. Now, why do you think God did this? Why do you think he sent them into the midst of the Sea of Galilee and he goes asleep? Now, do you, do you think he knew that they would be in the, these positions again? Maybe in ministry Maybe now that they're dealing with multitudes of people, they don't know what to do, how to handle them with family situations. And then they would look back and say, okay, Lord, I get it. If you can calm the sea with your word, then you can certainly do the work in this loved one's life. And I'm going to trust in that. And I'm going to rest in that. And I'm going to go to you. And I'm going to stop manipulating. Lord, I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to give you my faith and my love and my affection. And, and Lord, if you can calm the sea and it, and it can become still just like that, then I'm, sh I'm sure you can get me through this. Just like he does in our lives. That's exactly what he does. He arose, rebuked the wind, said unto the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Listen, he's going to teach them something rolling into the next chapter here. And I'll try to get into it a little bit. I'll get a little time. He's going to show them something. That when he speaks his word, things happen. When they start to learn to listen and obey his word, they'll have a little bit more peace in their lives. Make sense? When he speaks the word, things happen. When they start to learn to listen and obey, they have a little bit more peace. Why are you so fearful? Why didn't you trust my word? I said, let us go to the other side. We're going to get there. We're going. The wind and the sea obey him. They're scared. What kind of man is this? He just gave this whole sermon to the multitudes about the, you know, that was about the seed, which was about the word of God in the human heart. And, you know, we, we see all that, we get all that, but now he wants them to experience it in their lives. 
And he's, listen, he speaks the word to multitudes and he, he wants a result in their life. He wants some fruit to come forth in their life. He goes, he takes them into the midst of the storm because listen, they're going to be the ones to minister to the multitudes when Jesus goes to heaven, ascends. Then he rebukes the storm to show them that by his word, things happen. Now, here's the question. If God's word, God's word, Jesus speaking, can rebuke the wind and the sea and the storm and it can stop, can his word not work in somebody's life? That's what he's going to teach them. That's what he's going to show them. Now, listen, there's no chapter breaks in the original Greek. It rolls right in. So they came over, verse 1, to the other side of the sea. Like Jesus already said, let us go to the other side, right? Here they are. They were going to get there. And they came over onto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him, no, not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces neither could any man tame him so you get it there's this guy he's he's out of his mind in the in the area of of, of the gadarenes and it's it, listen it says that they tried to tame him he was he was gone he was mental now, whether it was self-inflicted or whether he was kind of born that way and things happened in his life, we don't know. But remember, keep in your mind, Jesus with his word calms the sea. How much more with his word does he want to free a human being created in the image of God to have some peace in their life, some right perspective, to understand how much God loves him or her? Because he does. Now listen. He goes, this guy comes running out of the tombs. This guy was mental. It said he was naked a lot. They try to bind him. They try to chain him down. His hands, it says fetters were, were things that they put on the, the feet to try to shackle his feet. And he had all this crazy strength. It says basically it's demonic strength. He was able to snap them. He was able to pluck them. And listen, what he tried to do to get relief, look at verse 5, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Cutting himself. There's a whole generation of, of kids that do that. Trying to get some perspective, some relief, trying to understand, you know, why all this pain? What life's all, what, what is life all about? What is going on? He's cutting himself. He's crying night and day in the tombs. See, they couldn't deal with him. Society could not deal with him. People could not tame him, the Bible says. They had no answer for him. We, listen, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We try to incarcerate. We try to medicate. We try to isolate. And I don't see many results. And it just makes me think, again, because, you know, I have a son, my son that's autistic, and he does some stuff like this. Yells all night long sometimes. And then when I read my Bible, and then when I get into what the Lord says, and listen, I can medicate him. But if I medicate him, who's that for? Is that for him or is that for me? This is just, again, this is just me. This is just my family. This isn't has anything to do with anybody else. But if I medicate them, that'll make my life easier. Certainly will. Make my wife's life, my, my wife's life easier. And I can identify with this crying and yelling all night long. See, I don't know what's going on in, in his mind. But I know what God do, that God does. And I know that Jesus loves him and, and, and died for him. And sometimes I got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, if I have to, and, and, and believe me, I do this stuff. I do this. You say, this, that's selfish, Pastor Matthew. You think like that. Well, 
I go to the Lord and I'm like, Lord, I'm like, I'm, I'm destined for the rest of my life to hear screaming and yelling all night long and not get any sleep. And then the Lord's got to speak to me. The Lord's got to talk to me. If he is like this his whole life, but he's with you in eternity and you can have a conversation, is it worth it? I'm like, yeah, Lord, it's worth it. It's worth it. And then when I read my Bible, right? And like, like, like how little is my faith? How little is my faith? Because sometimes, listen, sometimes my faith, this is my own personal situation. I don't know what anybody else is going through. But when I read my Bible, and it talks about prayer and fasting, and it talks about that he gave the disciples the power to cast out demons and to do these things. Now, does, can God do that? I believe he can. Is it the norm? Probably not. Probably not. But listen, I, I know miracles would happen if I had the discipline to be on my face for two, three, four hours a day and along with fasting. Just like the Bible says, this kind can't come forth but by prayer and fasting. So often my Christian life is, and, and it's okay, it's, we got to work, we got to labor for Jesus, we got to get things done. And that's good. The disciples did that. Paul did that. But then so much more, it's supposed to be the other way too. We have to labor in prayer, perseverance, and fasting. Nobody could deal with this man. Nobody could. They tried to incarcerate him. They tried to isolate him. They tried to do all those things. No one could deal with him. See, but Jesus saw the man. Jesus saw the person. And Jesus loved this person. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying, cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran, he worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now, obviously, the man's running to him, but it's the demonic presence that's in him. And he says, what are you doing here, Jesus? Why are you coming here? Verse 8. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? He asked the man, what is your name? The demons are going to be judged. He knows who they all are. That's why, listen, when sometimes Christians get like spooky and crazy with this stuff. They're like, well, I have the demon of lust. So the demon's name is lust. Lust, stay away from me, Mr. Demon. I have the demon of pornography. I have the demon of drug addiction. I have the demon of alcoholism. I have the demon. No, 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 no. Those are lust of your flesh. The Bible says you're drawn away and enticed. You want to do those things. And the demonic presence is around you, want to hold you down. But listen, a Christian cannot be demon possessed. Cannot be. You can be oppressed. The weight of the world can, can be on you all the time. Listen, I've been preaching this for about three months and it seems to come back in every sermon. God's probably trying to, trying to teach me something, that's why. But the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. That those things can be pulled down through prayer, fasting, obeying the word of God. And listen, just like God spoke to me through this chapter, and he says, how much have you prayed? How, much, how many times have you fasted for your son? How many times have you prayed for hours on him, crying out in agony? How many times have you done that, Pastor Matt? And I say, Lord, I do it some, but not, not too much. Not too much. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about just getting through the day. God. See, that's what he says to all of us. Our broken marriages, our broken homes, our broken finances, our broken attitudes. How many times have we really got down day and night and cried out to God and used the weapons that he's given to us and begged him, agonized in prayer? 
The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That means a hot prayer, a fervent prayer, that you're agonizing just like Jesus did in the garden. How many times have we done that? I don't know your, your life, but God does and you do. How many times? But when Jesus, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran, he worshiped him. He cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that you torment me not. For he said unto him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many, many devils, many tormentors involved in this man's life. And he besought him much that he, that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there, nigh unto the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000, and they were choked, or they drowned in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. Now, they don't come out to see what was done because, hey, this man is healed. They come out to see and say, hey, we're losing money now. The swine are all dead. That's why they come out. It's going to tell you in one second. But these, these, these evil spirits that, that tormented this man's life, they recognize Jesus. Jesus asked the man, what's your name? The demons speak for him and said, say we're many. Jesus says, get out of them. Go. Go away. Come out. They said, please don't send us and judge us before the time. He, and they basically say, let us go into the swine. Jesus says, go. And he heals this man. The swine, they're possessed now. They just run off the cliff, go into the water. They're, they're drowned. Everyone's looking around saying, hey, there's 2,000 pigs floating in the sea. That's <laughs> I guess pigs flew for a little while <laughs> off the side, right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't help. I can't help it. It's just stupid stuff comes to me, all right? <laughs> so they go in. They're drowned in the sea. People are looking. What happened to the pigs? Who, who did this? Look in verse 15. So they came to Jesus. And they see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion, the legion of demons, sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to them, to him, that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. They say, yeah, it's great that this guy, no one could take care of him. He was isolated. He was incarcerated. That's all fine and good, but what about the money? What about the swine? Jesus, can you just go away from here because you're costing us money? Leave us alone because you're costing the town money. And they pray him, they beg him, go away. Please go away. And that is so sad to me. So sad. Because Jesus cares about the man. Jesus healed the man. Instead of saying, wow, this, this guy was in the tombs for, for decades, chained there. No one could bind him, not with chains. They, they shackled his feet, his hands. They wanted nothing to do with him. He was, a, he was an outcast in society. Please keep him away from us. Now he's healed. And all the people care about is the money. You ever get that? Listen, I can remember. And I was a bad kid, yes, I was. When people come to me and they say, hey, you're a pastor now? And then they start to hear the way I talk a little bit, you know, with, you know, kind of the Shirley Avgana accent thing going on or whatever, and the Revere thing. They say, you must have been one of those bad people. That's why you're a pastor now. You know what I say? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. 
So I get saved, I give my life to Jesus, I start living for Jesus, I start living for God, and, and you know, I, I start getting involved in ministry and giving my time, giving my talents, giving my treasures, giving my money to the church. What do you think the people around me, the first thing they cared about is, oh, you're in a cult, you're giving 10% of your pay to church? No, that's all they want. That's all they care about. They didn't care that I was on the way to, to hell and destroying my life and other people's lives along the way, right? But now all they care about, oh, what about the money? You know, back then I made like $300 a week, 30 bucks, whoop-dee-doo. <laughs> but that's all they could see. It's all they cared about. So sad. And listen, when you read this story, when you read this story, if Jesus can rebuke the wind and the sea with his word, he can certainly deliver a life with his word. And, and listen, the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. You know what that means? That means when you look around the church, and I know we do this, when other brothers and sisters in Christ, and we say, hmm, how come they can have victory over this sin, that sin, this sin, and that sin, and how come they can't? How come they, and don't tell me you don't do this, how come they can have victory and they can't? So the ones that can't, let's isolate, medicate, incarcerate, because these ones, they're like, they must be special to Jesus, but these ones, yeah, Jesus loves them, but they, they just, you know, they can't have any victory. So let's just isolate them. See, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And if you believe that, how big is your God? How big is your Jesus? And you don't believe this book. You know what the Word of God says? There's no temptation given with such as common to man, but God is with the temptation, able to give that man or that woman a way of escape. You know what that means? All of us go through things. Now, God knows every tolerance level in every life. God knows every background in every life. God knows it all. And that's why I can never sit there and say, hey, I can get victory because of this, 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 and this, and you can't because of that, that, that. No, 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 no. You don't know my life. You don't know my background. You know, God knows all the tolerance levels, but the Bible says that God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that which you can bear. So you know what that means? That means some Christians choose to obey and some choose to disobey. That's what the New Testament says. And the measure of your victory in Jesus is the measure of how much you're willing to surrender and say, hey, God, I need you. I surrender. I can't do this without you. Please, God, do this in my life. That's where your victory comes from. When you die, he lives. If you don't want to die, then it's going to be you that lives. And that's kind of ugly. But God wants all his kids to have victory. All of them. All of them. And we need to pray for one another that way. And that's why I, I can never sit there and say, hey, I have victory in this area because I obey. Well, you know what the Bible says? That it, it, it's God that's at work in me, giving me the willingness to obey, just like he is in the other person. And it's our job to pray for one another in the body of Christ. It's our job to bear burdens with one another in the body of Christ. It's our job to suffer along with them. Because you know what Jesus wants? Jesus wants, just like this maniac of Gadara, to be, when, when he does a work, he wants them to be healed and seated in their right minds. That's what happened. Let's finish the story and we'll close. Verse 18. So the work is in the town, say, go away from us, Lord, just depart from us. Verse 18. And when he was coming to the ship... He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him. He asked him now that he might be with him. I want to go with you, Jesus. Look what Jesus says. Howbeit Jesus suffered him, allowed him not, but said unto him, Go home to your friends 
And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for you, and hath compassion on thee. And he, de- and he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Listen, because you know, Jesus goes and he starts to preach in Decapolis, and they, they're already hearing the story of this man, and multitudes come to Jesus because of this man's testimony. He says, go home and tell your friends, tell your family the great things that God has done for you. Listen, when God gives you a victory in your life, the first person you you, you should want to share it with is your wife or your husband and your children. And you pour into them. And that's why Jesus says, you can't come with me right now. Go get your wife. Go get your, you know, your loved ones. Go tell them about the things that I've done for you. And some of us want to get going, doing all these things for Jesus, and we just forget about the ones who are right next to us. or right there. God, listen, God has to bring pastors back to center all the time. And they say, this is what he says to us. Hmm. Just like Paul said in 1 Timothy, if we can't govern our own household, how can we take care of the house of God? We've got to minister to our families, just like this man had to.